by the Australian Government through money that came through to the Heart and Land Care Group in conjunction with a whole heap of land care groups and some of the farmer groups around the place. So um, it came out of some conversations between myself, Belinda Hackney and some researchers out of WA, some rhizobiologists and the like from WA. So people have sort of said anecdotally that subclover hasn't been performing um, as well as it has in the past. And um, so we wanted to actually test that idea in, over here in the Riverina area. So uh, some of the researchers from WA, Sophie DeMeyer and uh, John House and Ron Yates, the guys over there have done a little bit of work in WA, but we decided to do quite an in-depth study in the Riverina, which is uh, where this come from. So basically it was a sur survey project. So the reason why the project was important because clovers provide nitrogen for, um, Am I loud enough for everybody or do you want the mic? No? Okay. Um, clovers provide nitrogen in as far as... <coughs> yep, mic. Okay, sorry. Is that better? Yep. Okay. So clovers provide nitrogen um, for non-fixing species that are in the pastures with them, so for the grasses, but they also provide... Um, the clovers themselves provide a quality that you don't get usually from grasses as much. So it improves both production um, amount and also the quality that livestock are ac accessing. So what did we do? We looked at a um, 100, we, look, we were originally going to survey 100 paddocks, but when we started the project it was a lot bigger exercise than what I had originally thought. So we end up doing about 80 paddocks in the Riverina and from that um, from those paddocks we collected data from two times of the year. Uh, so the first sampling, which was started in about July, we took soil samples, we collected nodules from the plants that are clover plants themselves. So those nodules that occur on the clover plants is where the, those plants actually fix nitrogen. So the bacteria that infects the, the clover's roots is the thing that will actually take the nitrogen from the atmosphere. So we collected nodules, um, we rated the nodulation of the plants themselves, we took paddock history from the farmers because we were trying to work out what mechanisms might be involved in this decline in clover growth and also nodulation. Um, and we, then we... Range. But the bulk of the samples were from about 2000 onwards. Um, okay, so when we went out into the paddock, what we'd do was we'd actually dig up the clover and then we'd wash out the root system and then we'd rate those root system for nodule occup occupancy and also location and colour, etc. So this is a scoring sheet we, um, we used. And basically, so you get a bit of an idea what we're talking about. Anything that had a nodule score of four and above was adequate. Anything below that was probably not that effective in fixing nitrogen. And we do that by the colour of the nodules. So anybody knows anything about subclover nodules? If they're coloured pink, that means they're actually working and fixing nitrogen. If they're green or if they're white, that means that they're um, not effective, so the bacterium that's infected those root systems is something that's not actually able to fix nitrogen. And if they're sort of black or brown, it means that they've probably gone through their life cycle and they've died off, and um, there's probably other nodules coming on. Um, then we look at location down the root system. You'll tend to get a lot of um, bacteria in the top part of the root system around the crown. 
Um, but if you've got nodules forming the whole way down, that's actually a good thing, and you have better nitrogen fixing ability. Okay. So, just so you can see, it's a shame we can't turn these lights off, but um, this is a picture of probably a nodule score of about a half. So you can't, I don't know if you can see here, but there has got the odd nodule on it. Not many, but the odd nodule. <coughs> Um, that one's about a one. There's a few more nodules. You can see a big one hanging off there. There's a few, a few there. Um, I did all the scoring, so once I got my eye in, you could do it pretty quick, but I ended up scoring about two, over 2,000 plants. Uh, that's about a two and a half. It's got um, a, a few more nodules and they're a bit further down the root system. And this one, you can't really see it, but that's just a mass of nodules. So there's a lot of nodules um, all down the root system. These are quite large, what they call crown nodules. So, um, is that better? Can you see it? Yeah. There's a lot of nodules on that plant, but it's still probably only about a five. Is that better? So you can see these massive crown nodules. Much easier to collect, and then there's nodules sort of the whole way along. So what we were doing was we're taking those nodules off, we're putting them into vials with desiccating beads, and then those nodules got sent away to um, Sophie, who was in Switzerland at the time, and she put them through a system to find out what the type of uh, bacteria was in those. Ah, so that's a really good one. You can see all that sort of pink material is actually nodules. So that's probably a seven to an eight. So that's sort of the best of the plants we saw. But that was pretty uncommon. So what are the results? Um, leading into this, we, we thought we'd see, uh, we weren't sure what we we're going to see, but we thought we would see things like um, there, was, there would be a lot of uh, what we call feral bacteria in the nodules, bacteria that's not fixing nitrogen that wasn't of the commercial type. We thought we would see that. We weren't sure if um, uh, what sort of results we get, but we are pretty surprised by the results. So the first thing we found, and again, this is in your um, conference notes, is that a lot of the nodules, and this is my whole data set, and down here, this is the different types of bacteria as their classification. And when you look at those, you see, uh, a thing called WSM uh, 1325. That's the current commercial bacteria that's being applied with sub clover at the moment. So that, that's the commercial bacteria, the most effective one we have. So when you look at that data set, you'll see that plants that we sampled that contain just that uh, bacterium. But then there was a another group from here through that had that bacterium and then other types, some of the older types and some of the um, more wild types, so in mixtures. So the commercial bacterium was there, but it was in mixes with other stuff. And there was only a tiny group of samples, and this is this group of three samples here, that didn't have the commercial type on it. So that was really interesting because I had a lot of 1950s paddocks that either didn't have uh, rhizobium inoculated onto them when they were sown, or it would have been the very old time. So that's telling us that this commercial bacterium is actually getting out in the soil quite rapidly by itself. So it's, it's being moved around by animals and other stuff, and it's actually colonising plants. So that was, that was quite an interesting outcome. The other thing is we thought we'd see less of the commercial bacterium, because we thought we would see a lot of gene movement in the soil and that would be mixed up with sort of the, um, the non-sort of fixing rhizobium. But that was actually a surprise to us. That we had so much of that WSM 1325. So um, that was uh, an interesting outcome. Some money over at Murdoch is actually do some DNA testing. So although it's coming up with the test we used here as this commercial type, we're not sure how effective it is, so she needs to do some DNA testing to actually test that. Um, okay, so this was a, a, another interesting thing. So basically what this is showing here, here 
is the nodule score. So you can see I had very few of my um, plants that I actually sampled had a nodule score over four, four being adequate, everything under four being not as adequate. The bulk of my samples sat within the three to the zero range. Actually, um, I had most of my plants had nodules on them. I had very few that had no nodules whatsoever. So what that's saying is that a lot of the subclover plants that we looked at across that wide range of area is actually not effectively fixing nitrogen, which is impacting upon the pastures productivity, but it's also impacting upon any, if you're a mixed cropper, any subsequent cropping productivity. Because you're not going to have that residue of nitrogen in the soil, so you're going to have to apply it all by bag. So that was, um, yeah, that was, that was interesting. So the, the idea that the farmers have been saying to us that my subclovers anecdotally hasn't been performing as well, well there might be some grounds to that based upon this nodulation score. The other really interesting thing, because then I broke it down by year that the plants themselves were sown, was that there wasn't a lot of difference whether my plants were sown in the, my original paddock was sown in the 1950s and it's just been regenerating each year. So these are my old paddocks. However, my paddocks, um, my paddocks were sown sort of much more recently. The average overall was around sort of that two, two and a bit. So there wasn't much difference. In fact, um, yeah, so it didn't matter when it was sown, it, it appears that things aren't working very well regardless. Okay, so why is this so? So this is just a survey project, it's not a replicated research project. So we, we, we were looking to this to give us this project to give us a bit of an idea of things that we could look at in future in more detail to try and nut some of this out. Sophie's doing some more work over in WA um, based upon these results and her results over there. But um, when we're hoping to get some more money over here but to, to look at it in a bit more detail. But there seems to be, a re well, and, and it's a known relationship, but this data backs it up. There's a relationship between pH and high aluminium and low nodulation score. So we know that the subclover and also the rhizobium that do the nitrogen fixation are susceptible to low pH and we can see that quite clearly with our results. So if you look at this diagram, what it's showing is almost so soil um, spots, sampling spots, pasture spots. Um, the red dots are the very low, so under twos. The orange dots are twos to fours and the green dots are um, four to eight. That's, that's nodulation score. And then we looked at pH. So um, the dark blue dots inside, dark, dark blue squares inside the dots are actually low pH and the lighter, dot, the lighter squares are higher pH. And there's a, quite a good correlation and the stats show this as well, that where you have um, low nodulation score, it's usually associated with low pH. Um, this is not visually such a good diagram, but basically it's showing the relationship between aluminium and, and also the nodulation score. So same data I showed before with these bars coming up here is just percentages of aluminium. So where the bars actually leave the dots, that means it's a very high level of aluminium. That one's about 23 that's 12, that's somewhere around the 7. So that's high enough aluminium in the soil that's going to actually affect the ability of the rhizobium to function and actually colonise those plant roots. Okay, so the soil test results were interesting. Um, we found that uh, from the soil test we took, we found that 22% of the um, paddocks were acid in the topsoil. And then we found that about 40% of the paddocks were acid in the subsoil. So there is still a problem, and somebody mentioned it earlier today, about subsoil acidity. And that was very evident in um, our test results. And aluminium was more. 40% of our samples had high aluminium in the topsoil, and 80% uh, had high aluminium in the subsoil. So at those levels, they're going to start to affect um, clover growth. And what, you might what, we might, what we might be seeing with this and we didn't test it because um, the project wasn't set up for that, is that the plant roots, anything below that sort of, into that subsoil 
area is that it's going to root prune and it's going to affect any sort of nodulation at that rate. Um, uh, what else did we find? Early on when we were going into these paddocks and doing our sampling, we'd go into a paddock and it would be up to my knees in clover, subclover. And uh, most of the paddocks we looked at were subclover occasionally. There were other trifoliums like arrow leaf, etc. But they'd be huge clover paddocks. And we thought, this is really weird, because then you dig up the plants and they'd have very few nodules on them. But they were growing, like, obviously the plants were growing very well. So um, within the first week of us taking our soil samples, we started to freeze our soil samples because we were interested to see what nitrogen was doing in those paddocks. Because we had this theory that um, maybe those paddocks are going through a boom-bust cycle with nitrogen. So maybe what was happening was um, the clover percentage in the paddock was building up, the nitrogen, soil nitrogen was building up, and then they'd get, it'd get to such a level that in subsequent years that um, even though the clover was growing very well, the clovers were actually stopping, stopping the rhizobium infecting them because there's an energy cost for plants to allow those bacteria into their root systems. So maybe they were just going through some sort of a natural boom and bust and they were living off for a couple of years the free soil nitrogen that they'd fixed in previous years and as that started around they would let the rhizobium back in. So we started to sort of freeze our soil samples because we were wondering if that was a relationship we were seeing um, and we need to do some more analysis on that data to see if that was the case. But what we did find, and the reason we froze soil samples, sorry, was because um, Nitrogen transformations, once you take the samples, they change very rapidly in the bag because nitrogen uh, moves around quite a bit. So we froze them because they weren't all going off for sort of a couple of months to the lab. So we didn't want to confound the results. So, um, so we'll look at that in a bit more detail and try and find out if that natural boom-bust cycle is actually happening. Um, but there was a lot of low nitrogen status in the paddock. So even though, even paddocks with good subclover amounts, percentages, they still had quite low nitrogen. Um, the other thing we found was soil sulphur was quite low in the top 10 centimetres. Sulphur is actually important for clovers um, to fix nitrogen and make proteins, etc. So we're finding that, and the stats, the preliminary stats also showed there seemed to be a relationship between pore nodulation and sulphur. So um, we need to go back through our history data, we haven't done it yet, and look at what had been applied and see if there's a relationship between these low sulphur levels and also, um, and then the nodulation. A lot of um, people, um, will use high analysis fertilizers without much um, gypsum in it, like sing, a phosph single super has a lot of sulfur in it with the gypsum component that's in um, single. But when you're using MAP STAPS, those sorts of things, you actually don't get that for free, almost. So we're wondering if that's starting to have an impact where people are using high analysis fertilizers. Um, the other data that's not there, <coughs> two minutes, all right. The other data that's not there is it's not a, pH, a phosphorus issue. Most of my phosphorus was, were quite good. The bulk of the soil samples we looked at were over 25. In fact, there was a lot over 50, cold wall that is. So it wasn't actually a phosphorus issue. Uh, we took composition and this data just shows you that uh, annual species, whether they be annual grasses or annual legumes, make up a big component of these pastures that you guys are using for grazing. Um, annual grasses, some of that was vulpia, silver grass, uh, and some of it was barley grass and uh, silver grass, uh, sorry, rye grass, things that are more useful. Uh, okay, the other data we've got from the history was that um, people have been applying lime, and we can see that in the 010. Lots of people are putting on fertilizers, phosphorus uh, fertilizers, super, etc. Not many people are putting molly on. It seems to have fallen off the radar of people who, to use molybdenum in their pastures. It's an essential requirement for clovers. So that pink colour you see in nodules on legumes is actually um, a, a, has a requirement for molybdenum for that to happen. 
Molybdenum in acid soils gets locked up, it becomes less available. It seems people have forgotten that old rule of thumb of every four to five years put some molly on. It's in, in um, pasture situations. Uh, even in guys who are mixed farmers, so their pastures are in crop rotations with canola, it doesn't, they, even some of those weren't putting molly on. So I was a bit surprised by that. So if you get nothing else out of this, that old rule of thumb is not a bad thing to go by. So in summary, so all of that data we've collected and we still need to do some more stats on it. Hopefully we'll get a paper out later this year. Um, so we had low nodulation rates. Our nodule, nodule scores were in the sort of, it, were averaging about two, but most of them were less than four. So we had low nodulation, but the nodules that were there were of a favorable strain. So they were of a strain that is um, used commercially at the moment that's known to be able to effectively fix, um, fix nitrogen. I didn't show you the N15 data, the data that went over um, WA for analyses, but we found that there was what they call high NDFA percentages. And what that tells us is that the plants are fixing nitrogen. There's not many nodules on them, but they're of the right strain and they're fixing nitrogen. So that's good news. So they have a good nit nitrogen fixing ability. But it appears that there's the, the weakness is in the plant itself and its adaptation to acid soils and subsoil acidity. We seem to be getting just poor overall clover growth for whatever reason. And we think there's a few reasons, not only the um, acidity, maybe the low, uh, the low sulfur in the soils. We all think, also think that some of the chemicals we, well, we are using are causing residual effects um, and actually inhibiting those um, not legumes, uh, the <coughs> rhizobium, from actually infecting as well. So, what's, so what you're doing is getting overall poor clover growth, which then is actually impacting upon your ability to produce quality and quantity quality from the clover itself component, but also quantity from the, the amount of extra growth you get from a system that has nitrogen coming into it. Um, the, I haven't presented the data here because um, we haven't sort of got our heads around it yet, but Sophie did some work in WA looking at herbicides and the impact of herbicides and their residuals in soils. And um, there were some of the herbicides, and we know that sulfonylureas affect rhizobium, but there were other herbicides that were actually impacting and being quite residual in the soil that might be impacting upon these um, rhizobium ability to actually infect and fix nitrogen. So all of that adds up to poor um, potential livestock production, but also poor uh, nitrogen carryover for subsequent crops. So uh, just quickly, so summary, if you want to look at your own paddocks, dig up your plants. You've got to dig them up, don't pull them up because you'll pull the nodules off. Wash the roots out and you've got the scoring card in, those, um, in, in your manuals there. You could uh, have a look and see what your plants are doing themselves. You do that eight to ten weeks after the autumn break, so now is actually a really good time. Um, you could have a look at your soil tests and work out what's going on with your pH aluminium, particularly in the subsoil as well. Consider lime use if that's applicable to your situation. Um, definitely consider, consider molybdenum use if you haven't been using it. Um, think about what your herbicide usage are. There's a few <coughs> questions there and hopefully we'll have some more data around that soon. Um, and the other thing is, and we're going to try and look at this next year if we can find some money, is do some rhizobium top-ups. So try and increase the amount of effective rhizobium in the soil and see if that will actually give you an economic benefit. So there's some heap of question marks there. A, we don't know if we can do it well, and B, if we don't know if it's going to be economic. So, yeah, hopefully that'll happen. Uh, and, yeah, so we've got some more uh, applications in to do some further works around this and actually do some replicated trials if we can. Um, and we've got some soil testing workshops around for those who actually want to look at their own soils and see what's going on. Uh, that's it. Thank you. No worries. Thank you very much.